Melissa Rokuba lived in Laquana County, Pennsylvania in 2013 with her husband, Bruno Rokuba. On August 6, 2013, Bruno called 911, informing the operator that he accidentally shot Melissa in the head inside their home. Melissa was taken to the hospital but sadly succumbed to her injuries four days later. Initially, Bruno claimed it was an accident, attributing it to a playful interaction with a gun. However, his narrative changed seven times within the first 24 hours, initially mentioning a fight between them. Surveillance footage revealed a heated argument between Bruno and Melissa. Authorities also discovered that Melissa's mother intended to use a $1,500,000 family inheritance for a casino in the land city. Despite suspicions that Bruno intentionally shot Melissa, there was insufficient evidence for charges. A recent reinvestigation by the Pennsylvania State Police revealed that Bruno had previously pulled a gun on Melissa. It also unveiled a disturbing pattern of Bruno embezzling over $100,000 from the family inheritance since 2013, meant to be split between Bruno and his two daughters. New technology was employed to substantiate Bruno's intent to harm Melissa, though the specifics of the technology were not disclosed. Bruno Rakuba, 56 years old, was arrested on June 3, 2022 and charged with both homicide and theft. Trooper Robert Urban emphasized the diligent investigation, incorporating various technologies and interviews to clarify details and eliminate inconsistencies in Bruno's statements. Closure was achieved for the family, friends, and community with the conclusive evidence leading to Bruno's guilt. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments section. Also, if you like this content, subscribe please. We are very close to 1,000 family. Let's continue the video. 30-year-old Sherry Herrera lived in Tulare, California in 1993. She was a mother of four known to be a prostitute and drug user. Her family reported her missing on March 25, 1993. Five days later, on March 30th, Sherry's body was discovered on the Hayfield Road on-ramp to the I-10 in Desert Center, a rural area between Los Angeles and Phoenix. She had been assaulted, strangled with a belt, and bore a bite mark on her body. Investigators collected DNA evidence and entered it into the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODES, in 2002. In 2004, DNA from another cold case, that of Sheena Denise Hayes from Titus County, Texas, was also added to Cody's. Sheena, a prostitute like Sherry, was assaulted and strangled in April 1992. DNA analysis in 2004 revealed that the same man was responsible for both Sheena and Sherry's deaths. Although his identity remained unknown due to limited DNA technology, it was established that he was likely African American and possibly residing in California or Texas. In September 2020, officials from Texas and California collaborated on genealogy research, leading to the identification of 67-year-old Douglas Thomas as the perpetrator. Thomas was arrested at his home in Waco, Texas in May 2022 for the murder of Sheena Denise Hayes. Subsequent DNA testing confirmed his involvement in Sherry Herrera's case as well. Currently held in McClendon County Jail on a $2 million bond, Thomas will face prosecution in Texas before being transferred to California for additional charges. A former truck driver with over 40 years of experience, Thomas traveled extensively around the U.S. before retiring. Investigators are exploring the possibility of his involvement in other unsolved cold cases. Authorities in California encourage anyone with information about the case to contact the Riverside County Regional Cold Case Homicide Team at 1951952777. Sherry's son Adrian, who was only six years old when his mother was murdered, expressed mixed emotions following the arrest, reflecting on the long passage of time since the tragic event. 23-year-old Diane Cusick lived in Nassau County, New York, in 1968, where she worked as a dance teacher. Diane, estranged from her husband, lived with her parents and their daughter, Darlene. On the night of February 15, 1968, Diane called her parents, informing them of her plan to go to the mall to buy shoes. Tragically, she never returned home. Worried after a few hours, Diane's father drove to the mall and discovered her body in the back seat of the family's 1961 Plymouth Valiant in the parking lot of the Valley Stream's Green Acres Mall. Diane had been brutally beaten, assaulted, suffocated, and had defensive wounds on her hands. Investigators released a description of a suspect, a white male in his late teens or early twenties, with an average build, 
eyeglasses, and standing at least 5 feet 8 inches tall. This man had been seen at the movie theater in the mall shortly before Diane's body was found. Over a hundred Nassau police officers searched the area and her photo was shown to over 2,000 people to gather information on her last hours. DNA belonging to the suspect was collected from the crime scene. Diane's estranged husband was ruled out as a suspect as he was working his part-time job as a taxi driver during the crime. Despite initial efforts, the trail grew cold and leads dried up over the years. In June 2022, investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile into public databases and found a match. The DNA belonged to Richard Cottingham, already serving a life sentence in a New Jersey prison for taking the lives of multiple women. Cottingham pleaded not guilty but faced 25 years to life in prison if convicted. Due to his poor health, he was arraigned in a hospital bed wearing a patient's gown and a face mask. Nassau County District Attorney and Donnelly emphasized that this might be the oldest case prosecuted based on DNA evidence. She warned against being deceived by Cottingham's frail appearance, highlighting his violent history as a predator. Diane's daughter, Darlene Jean Altman, expressed her surprise and gratitude for finally achieving justice. Detectives are now investigating unsolved cases from 1967 to 1980 when Cottingham was active, expanding their focus beyond his known areas of activity in Virginia County and Manhattan. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments section. 17-year-old Michelle Coast lived in Seattle, Washington in 1990. She was last seen leaving a friend's apartment on 18th. A week later, her body was discovered near Eco Lake Road on Highway 522 in Instahamish, approximately 15 miles from where she was last seen. Michelle had been assaulted and suffered blunt force trauma to the head with pieces of concrete determined as the weapon. DNA collected from the crime scene did not initially yield results, and questioning individuals with similar criminal histories in the area provided no useful information. The case went cold until detectives Jim Sharp and David Heitzman reopened it in 2005. A DNA profile of the suspect was created and entered into the federal database, but no matches were found. Turning to Parabon Nanolabs for assistance, the genetic genealogy experts spent about a year deconvoluting the DNA sample, building family trees, and entering findings into public genealogy websites. In 2022, after further testing, investigators announced that Robert Brooks was the man responsible for Michelle Kosk's tragic death. Brooks, 22 years old at the time of the crime, had recently been released from prison and was living a few blocks from Michelle's residence. It remains unclear whether they knew each other. Robert Brooks passed away due to natural causes at the age of 48 in King County, Washington on October 26, 2016. The estimated probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual with a matching DNA profile from the U.S. population was 1 in 1.2 quadrillion, according to the Sheriff's Office. Detective Sharp, who also played a role in solving other cases like those of Jay Cook and Tanya Vankulenberg, received praise from both the Sheriff's Office and Parabon Nanolabs. During a news conference, friends and those who knew Michelle, including her friend Melissa Johnson, expressed relief that the case had finally been solved. Melissa, who had known Michelle since she was 10 years old, shared thoughts about the impact on their lives and expressed hope that Michelle can now rest in peace. Sabir Chatterjee lived in Houston, Texas in 2002, originally from Sri Lanka. He owned and operated the Coastal Gas Station Convenience Store. On February 15, 2002, around 12.50 p.m., officers from the Oak Ridge North Police Department responded to Sabir's store following reports of gunshots. Subsequent investigation revealed Sabir's lifeless body in the office area having suffered a fatal gunshot to the head. Additionally, a significant sum of $100,000 in cash had been stolen from the store. Forensic evidence, including DNA found under Sabir's fingernails and blood from the suspect, was collected at the crime scene. Despite limited leads and vague witness descriptions, law enforcement faced challenges in solving the case. With no surveillance footage available, the investigation went cold for nearly two decades. Detective Kent Hubbard, the first responder to the scene, persisted in the investigation. After discovering how law enforcement in California successfully used genealogy and DNA to solve cold cases, Hubbard reached out to Parabon Nanolabs. This organization specializes in genetic genealogy, phenotyping, ancestry, and can analysis to assist law enforcement in identifying potential suspects based on DNA evidence. 
With the support of the Oak Ridge Police Department and the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office, Hubbard secured funds for testing. In 2018, Parabon Nanolabs identified three potential men whose DNA might match the sample from the 2002 crime scene. In 2019, investigators collected a DNA sample from one of the men, Martin Isaac Tells, at a restaurant. Subsequent DNA testing confirmed on December 4, 2019 that Tells' DNA matched the one found at the crime scene. On December 10, 2019, Tells was arrested for the crime. Following his arrest, Tells confessed to taking Sabir's life during a robbery, explaining that Sabir's blood was present at the scene because he had struck Tells in the head with a telephone in self-defense. While the case was pending, Tells, who had been out on a $500,000 bail, cut off his GPS monitoring device and fled to Mexico. Agents from Homeland Security and the U.S. Marshals successfully tracked him down and brought him back to the U.S. Tells pleaded guilty on June 28, 2022 and was subsequently sentenced to 60 years in prison. Assistant District Attorney Donna Hansen emphasized the impact on Sabir's family, stating that Martin Tells had lived more than 20 years with his family while members of the Chatterjee family were left with an empty chair and aching hearts. Detective Kent Hubbard's relentless pursuit of justice and the collaboration with Parabon Nanolabs ultimately brought closure and justice to Sabir's family. District Attorney Brett Legion acknowledged Detective Hubbard's determination, stating that his efforts turned what was wrong into something right and hoped that the measure of accountability would provide relief to the grieving family. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments section. 37-year-old Lena Reyes Geddes lived in Youngstown, Ohio, with her husband, Edward Geddes. On April 8, 1998, Lena embarked on a trip from Ohio to Dallas and then to New Mexico to visit her family. Unfortunately, this would be the last time anyone saw Lena alive. Six months later, with no sign of Lena since she left home, Edward reported her missing. Investigators found it peculiar that it took six months for Edward to report her missing, leading to him being named a suspect. However, concrete evidence against him was lacking. In October 1998, Edward was interviewed by the police, claiming he dropped Lena off at the airport for her planned flight from Pittsburgh. On April 20, 1998, an unidentified deceased female, in her late 30s to mid-40s, was discovered along State Route 276 near Maiden Springs in Utah's Garfield County. The woman had been shot, her hands severed, and she was wrapped in plastic bags, duct tape, rope, and a sleeping bag before being placed inside a carpet. Despite extensive efforts by the Garfield County Sheriff's Office and the Utah State Bureau of Investigation, the woman remained unidentified and the case went cold. She became known as the Maiden Water Jane Doe. In 2018, Ohio updated Lena's missing persons file, obtaining a picture from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Immigration and Customs Enforcement. A California citizen researching true crime cases connected the Maiden Water Jane Doe case to Lena, noting a mole in the right ear. Utah authorities were informed and Lena's sister provided DNA swabs confirming the Doe's identity. Investigators sought to determine who took Lena's life, considering Edward Getty and another individual, Scott Kimball, who had a history of violence but was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. DNA belonging to a male was found on the rope at the crime scene. Attempts to compare it to Edward's DNA were hindered by his cremation, but family members provided samples. In 2022, it was confirmed that Edward Getty's DNA matched the DNA found on the rope. Investigators announced in June 2022 that there was enough evidence to conclude he was responsible for Lena's death and to close the case. Despite the frustration that Edward is not alive to face charges, the closure provides some relief. Investigators found no evidence that Lena had traveled, believing the trip was a ruse by Edward. The Utah State Bureau of Investigation agent, Brian Davis, highlighted the closure and answers the case brought. Lena's sister, Lucero, expressed a sense of vindication after two decades of seeking answers, saying she is now bringing her sister back home. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments section. 22-year-old Rashid Young lived in Pottstown, Pennsylvania in 2019, approximately 40 miles northwest of Philadelphia. He shared a residence with his boyfriend, Kishan Sheffield, who was 17 at the time. Rashid disappeared on August 19, 2019, and his family and friends subsequently received text messages from his phone, severing ties with them. A little over a month later, decomposed remains of an unidentified male were discovered in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia by a landscaper. 
The victim couldn't be identified during the initial post-mortem examination. In December 2019, two months after Rashid was last seen, Kishan reported him missing. Unfortunately, the connection between the unidentified body and Rashid's disappearance was not initially established, leading to over two years of unidentified remains. Montgomery County investigators intensified their efforts and Rashid's family hired a private investigator. Through a confidential informant, cell phone records, and other investigative means, it was discovered that Rashid had been in a relationship with Kashan for two years before he disappeared. Investigators, previously unaware of Kashan's involvement, interviewed him. Kashan claimed to have lost contact with Rashid after a fight, but investigators suspected he wasn't fully disclosing what he knew. A witness eventually came forward admitting to assisting Sheffield in burying Rashid's body at Aubrey Arbor Ray Dam. Investigators confirmed that the unknown male buried in the Arboretum was indeed Rashid. They also discovered that Kashan Sheffield made numerous withdrawals from Rashid's $2 million trust fund, was using Rashid's car, sent messages to Rashid's family and friends cutting ties, impersonating Rashid, and intentionally flooded Rashid's house to eliminate potential evidence. On June 1, 2022, Kashan Sheffield was arrested at his home in Philadelphia in connection to the case. He is currently in custody at the Montgomery County Detention Facility without bail. Investigators provided a summary of the events in their press conference, stating that Sheffield fatally stabbed Rashid at their home on August 19, 2019. He later intentionally flooded the residence, disposed of Rashid's remains, and buried him at the Arboretum. Sheffield continued to access Rashid's social media accounts, giving the appearance that Rashid was still alive from August to December 2019. While investigators have not disclosed a motive, they described the crime as domestic violence related. Sheffield faces charges including taking Rashid's life, theft by unlawful taking, receiving stolen property, possessing an instrument of crime, and access device fraud. On December 8, 1993, a homeowner in Choctaw County, Oklahoma, discovered human remains in her backyard and promptly called 911. Deputies from the Choctaw County Sheriff's Office responded to the home and reached out to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation for assistance. An autopsy conducted by doctors in the Oklahoma Chief Medical Examiner's Office determined that the remains belonged to a male baby who had been born alive. Tragically, the medical examiner ruled that the baby boy's throat had been slashed. Despite numerous interviews conducted by investigators after the discovery, the case went cold. In 2020, law enforcement revisited the case to identify the boy, submitting DNA evidence collected from the scene to Parabon Nano Labs, known for providing phenotyping services to law enforcement agencies. The results, returned in April 2021, prompted the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation team to pursue new leads leading them to 53-year-old Mounia Michelle Allen. On June 15, 2022, an Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agent interviewed Allen at the Durant Police Department. During the interview, Allen agreed to submit DNA samples to determine if she was the biological mother of the unidentified baby, Baby Doe. Shortly after providing the DNA sample, Allen admitted to being the biological mother and, during a subsequent interview, confessed to cutting the baby's throat shortly after his birth. At the time of the incident, Allen worked at a daycare center, and investigators noted that she had not disclosed her pregnancy or delivery to anyone. Mountie Michelle Allen was booked into the Choctaw County Detention Center and is being held without bond. The motive behind her actions and the identity of the baby's father have not been disclosed. Ricky Adams, the director of the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, praised the synergy between agents and criminalists, especially in solving cold cases with unidentified victims. He acknowledged the significant contributions of genetic genealogy tools, Parabon, and internal genealogy specialists in providing leads in this disturbing case. With Baby Doe now identified, proper arrangements can be made for a respectful resting place and Allen will be held accountable for her actions. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments section.